Hey there, interwebs. Almost exactly one year ago, I posted a video in which I posited that a combination weapon joining the Godin Dog and Disc Mace, which I called the Godin Disc, might be the ideal weapon for someone looking to arm a peasant's revolt. I still stand by what I said in it, but in the comments below I received a reply from fellow YouTuber Ace the Supervillain arguing that the Grain Flail would have been a superior choice. I am not wholly convinced, but I'll certainly grant a degree of legitimacy to that idea which I hadn't previously considered. In fact, I feel it has so much validity that I've decided to make an entire video addressing the topic. Before we get too deep into the weeds, however, it's only prudent to make sure we're all on the same page and establish what exactly we're talking about, because the word flail can mean a lot of things. Is this a flail? Yes, specifically, it's a peasant's threshing flail. How about this, though? Is it also a flail? Again, yes it is. But hang on, some of you may cry, it's got spikes on it, that makes it a morning star. Well, if you believe that, you're right. But hang on, some others amongst you may cry, this is a morning star. And, in this hypothetical argument between medieval weaponry geeks, the first group replies, it's a mace. Here's the crazy thing, none of these statements are wrong, at least not according to my personal definitions, although yours may vary. If you ask me, both maces and flails are bludgeoning-oriented impact weapons utilizing a roughly radially symmetric head. The difference is that a mace's head is mounted on a shaft with a rigid connection, while a flail is attached via a chain, rope, or other flexible method. Both can also be a morning star, although neither one has to be. This is because, again by my definition, a morning star is an impact weapon with a roughly radially symmetric head, like maces and flails, but which is also covered in spikes or similar protrusions designed to inflict piercing damage to the target, whether that be flesh, armor, or shield. This means that a Morning Star is a variation or modification to other weapons, rather than a category of its own. The specific type of flail which we care about today is the Grain Flail, also known as the Threshing Flail, Agricultural Flail, or Peasant's Flail, and it is identified by having a long two-handed haft with a shorter length of wood connected at the top with a short rope or chain, in contrast to the single-handed military flails, which frequently had a more spheroid head on a longer chain. The agricultural flail can also be further militarized by the addition of metal spikes, turning it into a two-handed morning star of sorts, although this isn't necessary for it to be effective in combat. Now that we're all, theoretically, in agreement on what a flail is, we can address the more substantial questions of this video. Were they ever used as weapons? What are their strengths and weaknesses? And finally, are they a good weapon for a peasant's revolt? So, were flails used as weapons historically? The short answer is yes. The medium-length answer is yes, but, and the long answer is yes, but some people beg to differ. You see, it's not unheard of for people within the HEMA community to try to combat one historical misconception by leaning too far in the opposite direction. For example, there used to be this idea that knightly broadswords were little more than blunt objects useful only as clumsy bludgeons, and that knights were these lumbering brutes in heavy suits of armor, which were so cumbersome that they required the aid of a crane to mount their horses for a joust, or that they couldn't even get back onto their feet if knocked over. History nerds then tried to fight this idea with claims that actually, medieval European swords were so sharp and nimble and well-balanced that they were as light as a feather, like a magic wand of death, and that a well-made suit of armor won't impede the motion of its wearer in the slightest. In reality, all of these claims are bullshit. Good swords shouldn't handle like crowbars, but they're still solid pieces of steel, and while someone who's used to wearing properly fitted armor can be surprisingly agile, there will always be a trade-off between protection and mobility. Flails get the same treatment. They're popular in fiction because they seem slightly exotic and they look very flashy on screen, but historical examples are thin on the ground. So thin, in fact, that some historical scholars have argued that they never existed at all, writing the notion off as an anachronistic fantasy and dismissing any surviving historical examples as forgeries from later periods such as the Victorian era. In truth, the medieval war flail did exist, but it wasn't nearly as common as historically inspired fiction might lead you to believe. Since some people chose to use flails as weapons in real life-or-death combat, they must have had some benefit which led their users to choose them instead of swords, spears, or even just big sticks. So what were they? Well, first of all, Matt of Scala Gladiatoria and Todd of Todd's Workshop have made several videos, both independently and together, regarding the martial use of flails, so rather than retread everything they've already said, and in better detail, I'll simply post links to their work in the description and touch upon a few key points. The first one, which Matt mentioned, is that peasant farmers would use these tools every day and be familiar with their use. Related to this is the fact that the tool which you use every day is a tool which you already have. I've argued that the Gooden Disc was a great weapon for arming lots of peasants quickly because it cost very little in terms of time and material to produce, but the weapon you already have costs nothing. Sure, as I mentioned earlier, you could hammer some spikes into the end to make it more offensive, but you don't have to in order to have a functional weapon. 
On the flip side, while threshing flails were an everyday thing amongst the peasantry, military flails were such a rarity on medieval battlefields that some people claim they never existed at all, and that medieval images were just fanciful creations by the artists of yore. Why do I mention this? One word. Familiarity. Home field advantage is a real thing. If you pit two armies against each other, ceteris paribus, the local boys are more likely to win, because they know all the ins and outs and little nooks and crannies nearby that they can turn to their advantage. Well, home field advantage also applies to weapons, at least at a metaphorical level. Being more familiar with your chosen arme de guerre than your opponent gives you the proverbial edge, even if it's not an edged weapon. Usually, I don't place a whole lot of faith in the argument that an exotic weapon will fatally stymie your enemy, because it's often trotted out as a weak defense of truly ridiculous or outlandish designs, or, on the other hand, the weapon in question isn't outlandish enough. Your weird reverse-edge hooked knife with spikes on it is still, at its core, a knife, and any veteran combatant knows how to defend against a knife. Flails might just be the exception to all this. They're sufficiently far from what's normal that people unused to them have difficulty defending against them, and one mistake is all a good attacker needs to defeat their enemy. If flails were such a fantastic weapon, no pun intended, then why were they such a rarity on the battlefield? Why wasn't every knight and man-at-arms swinging a heavy object on a chain? Or, in other words, what's the catch? The classic, although some might say cliché, argument that is so often brought out against the use of flails is that they are more dangerous to their user than the target, with some more reasonable detractors adding the caveat, if you don't know what you're doing. I have to admit, that's true, but it's also true of every weapon. You're on YouTube right now, go look up sword fighting accident, or better yet, don't. I've seen people nearly take their leg off with an axe due to a glancing blow, and others hit themselves in the head trying to twirl a quarterstaff. People even break their hands just by punching the wrong target, no weapon involved. To put it simply, if you don't know how to fight with what you've got, you're going to get hurt. Or, in the words of legendary swordsman Miyamoto Musashi, the immature martial art is a source of great injury. So yeah, if you just pick up a flail with no prior experience and start flailing it about, I'll be surprised if you don't whack yourself within a few minutes. But you're also not a medieval peasant, and the purpose of this thought exercise is to find the best weapon for a peasant's revolt. Although some were tradesmen, such as blacksmiths or wainwrights, many peasants were farmers. This means that by the time one reached a reasonable fighting age, he or she would have already been familiar enough with the flail as an agricultural tool for threshing grain to know how to swing one without accidentally hitting themselves with it. Expanding our focus slightly further out now, the flail's detractors also like to claim that even if you know how not to hit yourself with it, it's still a threat to your allies around you as well, not just your enemies. Again, so are lots of other weapons. There's a reason huge two-handed swords don't see a whole lot of use in tightly packed formations. Furthermore, unlike, for example, blacksmithing, which was just one dude and maybe his apprentice swinging a hammer in his shop, peasants threshed grain as a team, where not hitting your friend Bill was just as important as not walloping yourself. And don't just take my word for it that flails could be wielded in anger in close formations, either. The peasant armies under the command of Jan One-Eyed Jack Zizka in the Hussite Rebellion were used from the fortified but small positions of their war wagons, and so effectively that the weaponized threshing flail is often known as the Hussite flail to this day. I think the real drawback of the two-handed flail in military use is, ironically enough, its inflexibility. Metaphorically, of course. As Matt pointed out, it is a bit of a one-trick pony. It's good for thwacking people really hard, but that's pretty much the only string to its proverbial bow. Incidentally, the longbow also isn't a bad weapon for a peasant uprising. The flail is also a difficult weapon to parry with. Typically, if you're going to attempt to deflect an opponent's blow, you want to do so with a rigid object, not one which is all wibbly-wobbly. Sure, you could use the haft of the flail rather than its head, which is what I would recommend, but then you've still got the head dangling off the end, resisting quick, nimble movements of the weapon. Historically, when combatants used weapons which weren't nimble, such as axes, they eschewed parrying in favor of holding a shield in the offhand instead, but with these two-handed flails, well, it's right there in the name. You won't have an offhand to hold that shield. Alright, enough beating around the bush, no pun intended. Would flails be a good choice for a peasant's revolt? Well... It's cheap and easy to produce, and most peasants would already have access to one and familiarity with it, but it's also sufficiently outside the battlefield norm that most noblemen and professional soldiers would probably struggle to defend against it in ways that they wouldn't have against spears and clubs, so it's got some major upshots. The downside is that its defense kind of sucks, and its versatility is even worse. So is it a good peasant's weapon? Yes. Would I equip every soldier with it in my hypothetical peasant's revolt? Hell no. In order to get maximum offensive utility out of flails, I feel that they would have to be distributed amongst people with other weapons, such as spears, gooden discs, and bows, in a primitive sort of combined arm strategy. But who would ever expect peasants to know how to work together as a team? Thanks for watching, and workers of the world, unite!
A specific subtype of flails are nunchucks. I've already made a video examining their utility as a traveler's weapon, and neither travelers nor peasants want to break the bank for their weapons. In German, the Morning Star is known as der Morgenstern, which literally translates back to Morning Star, but it doesn't give rise to homophone confusion. What do I mean by that? When I was but a wee skelf, maybe 8 to 10 years old, I thought Morning Star had a U in it. It would have been like edgelord swords called Blade of Misery, or what have you. If someone hits you with one, your loved ones will be in mourning. It made perfect sense to my 8-year-old brain. 